All right, go ahead and stand. Are you ready to get into the Word today? Yes. All right. Amen. Amen. Look at the person next to you and say, you're looking good today. Now just wish him a Merry Christmas. Can you do that? Merry Christmas. Amen. So glad you're here today. Now I want you to just to say this. Say, I'm living by faith. Tell him, the person. Now tell the person on the other side. Say, I'm living by faith. Amen. That's awesome. All right, let's put this first scripture up there. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Everybody say, but God. But God. Who is rich in mercy because of his great what? Love. Love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses, dead in our sin, made us what? Alive, Alive together with Christ. By grace. You have been saved. Isn't that awesome? All right, reach over, take somebody by the hand. I think we could close right there. Man. That was powerful. <laughs> All right, Father, we thank you for your presence. Lord, we're excited to get into your word. Oh, thank you, Lord, for the peace, your peace that passes all understanding. Thank you, Lord. Let it flow into this room, into each person's heart. Lord, I just release and speak love, joy, peace into everyone that's here, everyone watching. Lord, we pray that you bless them abundantly. And Father, we want to hear from you today. We open up the ears of our hearts and our minds. Lord, just speak to us. We love you. In Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. 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 You can be seated. I'm going to take my time. Is that all right? I have been rushing around all morning, and I'm just going to slow down. All right, we're going to slow down. Ephesians 1. No, I'm kidding. That would be a long day, wouldn't it? So we're getting, ready to, we're getting ready to step. Yeah, I could sit down and preach. Some people do that. I, I don't think I could do that. I have to walk and think a little. It helps me think. So we're getting ready to step into a new year. Are you excited? No. So as we transition from 2022 to 2023, we're going to begin to talk about grace again. How many love that? Amen. This is our assignment as a church to share the gospel of grace. We go deeper into some things, but what we're going to do today is begin to lay the foundation and get back into it because it's important for us. Amen. I've talked to so many Christians who are actually living in bondage because they don't understand the grace of Christ. And I, I was there. You don't have to raise your hand, but were you there? Or they understand part of it, but they're actually mixing law and grace. I did that too. So I've, I've found out that we need to be reminded and continue to study and go deeper into grace all the time. Amen? Amen. It's not a one-time revelation and we're good, because if we start to hear some law preaching, we can actually, it changes our thinking. So we have to be in, deep into grace. As we grow, God will continue to lift that veil and show us much more. As we continue to grow numerically as a church, we have new people coming in who haven't heard this gospel before. Right? So it's important to go back and reinforce this revelation. Let's check this out. So that's what today's going to be a lot of review for many of you. But it's important that we get this down in our hearts. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, in our sins, made us alive together with Christ by what? Grace, grace you have been saved. So let's begin with this phrase by grace you have been saved. So what is grace? Grace is everything that God has made available. Okay? Grace is the finished work of Jesus. Grace is not a curriculum. Grace is not a teaching series. Joe's over there and all he teaches is grace. No, it's the gospel. Everybody say it's the gospel. Grace has provided salvation, healing, abundance, rest, peace, joy, overflow, increase, restoration, on and on. And this is important to understand because Jesus stopped working and sat down at the right hand of the Father, right? Look at your neighbor say, it's done. It's done. So, so I'm not praying to try to get God's attention. I'm not praying to get him to move on my behalf. He's already moved. Right? His grace has made it available. Jesus isn't going back to the cross every time that I sin. Oh, Joe messed up. I better go. Right? Everybody say, it's done. it's done. I want you to get that. That's so important. Everybody say, this is grace. I'm just laying it out there for you. He's not getting whipped again with the stripes on his back when you get a bad doctor's report. It's done. Say it again. Say it's done. it's done. So grace has made all of this available to us. Now let's go to verse 6. And raised us up together. Back up. Let's, we'll read all these together. This is important. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, because of his love he provides all this for us, even when we were dead in trespasses, even when we were dead in our sins, he provided, grace provided all this. Before you were born, it was, your healing is there. 
Your salvation is there. Before you were thought of. Before your great-grandparents were thought of. Are you, I want you to get this. Are you getting it? Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Now verse 6. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Spiritually, you and I are seated in heaven right now in Christ Jesus. And I want you to get this. This means that you're living life from a place of victory. It's so important. The enemy wants us to believe that we're down here on earth living this life all alone, trying to pray hard enough, trying to pray just right so that God will hear my prayers, come have pity on me, and hopefully do something in in my life because I'm just a lowly worm. Anybody know what I'm talking about? There are a lot of Christians that live life like that. And I don't mean to hurt anyone's feelings, but that's twisted. It's not right. Look at your neighbor and say, it's not right. And yet a lot of believers are living life like that. But if I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, then I'm living life from a place of rest. I want you to get this. Notice it doesn't say we are, place, we are pacing the floor of heaven in Christ Jesus. We are stressed out trying to make things happen in Christ Jesus made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If we are in Christ and he is sitting, that's rest. Right now you're resting, I'm working. I'm standing, you're sitting, right? You getting it? That was deep. Write that down. (laughs) (laughs) And raised us up together. When you get saved, you're raised up together, made us sit together. So now if you get this in your heart, I'm actually living life from a place of rest. Many Christians are trying to get to heaven. Pray for me, brother, so that I can make it. Oh, I just want to hear my name when he... Are you with me? But we're actually already there, spiritually speaking. So when I know that, the blessed assurance that I am saved beyond a shadow of a doubt, I cannot lose my salvation, I am seated in heavenly places. Oh, there's some rest in my heart, in my spirit. Somebody say amen. Amen. So I don't stress out when the enemy sends things into my life. Does that make sense? Look at your neighbor and say, I'm at rest. That is important. Verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his what? Grace. Grace. We're talking about grace. In his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. In the ages to come means that we're still going to be learning about grace even when we get to heaven. So that means none of us have arrived. Amen. Amen. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. I believe when we're in heaven and he's talking to us and Jesus is continuing to teach us and lead and guide us, he's going to be showing us what his grace is all about. And we're probably going to look at each other and say, we had no idea. (laughs) We just barely scratched the surface. Are you with me? It's so important. That's what he's talking about in the ages to come. All right, verse 8. For by what? Grace. Grace you have been saved through And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So how do we get saved? How do we get born again? By grace. Why? Because grace has provided salvation. If grace hasn't provided it, then I can't receive it. I want you to think about that. If grace hasn't provided it, then I can't use my faith to receive it. I'm trying to be careful how far I go into that. But if it's not provided by grace, I think about all these things are up here when I'm preaching. I see they're just grace. It's been provided, so it's mine. So now I can use my faith to receive it. I can't, I'm just going to say it. I can't use my faith to get another man's wife. Why? Grace didn't provide it. Now I got your attention, right? Because those things happen in church. Okay, and we're going to keep moving. That's why I thought about should I share that. I can't use my faith to get your house. I want Todd's car. I'd like to have his. Not one like it. I want his. I can't use my faith for that. Grace grace didn't provide it. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Christians need to be taught these things because sometimes we get so far into faith, we start using our faith for weird things and God hasn't even provided it. And then we get upset at God. He's like, would you read this book right here? (laughs) All right, are you with me? All right, that's just a little detour. Because of God's grace, you and I can now receive forgiveness of sins. It's not anything that we can do, all right? It's not anything that you and I have done. It's God's grace. So grace is everything that God has made available, but how do we access it? It's provided by grace, but you and I receive it through faith. Everybody say faith. Faith. I want you to say this. Say grace is God's part. part. Faith is my part. part. Say it again. Grace is God's part. Faith Faith is my part. Joey's helping me preach today. That's awesome. All right, put this up on the screen, Chuck. 
Faith is my positive response to what God has made available. So we've talked about grace. Grace is everything God has made available. Now faith, I receive it with my faith, through faith. Faith is my positive response to what God has made available to his, by his grace. So faith is my positive response. Now I'm going to mess with some people's theology. My faith doesn't move God. My faith does not move God. Why? Because God's already moved. He's not going back to the cross. We talked about that, right? My faith positions me to receive what he's already done. I don't use my faith to get his attention and get him to move. He's already moved. He sat down. It is finished. Jesus sat down. So now I use my faith to position me to receive the finished work of Jesus. Are you getting it? Under the spout where the glory comes out, is what Joseph Prince says. <laughs> Your faith positions you to receive what's already been supplied. Somebody say amen. amen. God's already moved. So I'm not trying to get God to do anything. I used to be that Christian. I mean, if I pray just enough, if I pray hard, if I spend enough time in here praying, I'll get God to move on, on the church. That's wrong. He's already moved. Are you seeing this? If I fast enough, if some people believe, if I give enough, if I sing loud enough on Sunday morning. <laughs> we try all kinds of things thinking that, that that's our faith, but my faith actually positions me to receive what's already provided. If that's making sense, just put your hands together. Come on. Amen. It's so awesome. So I'm not trying to get God to do anything. He did it. He came wrapped up in flesh, gave his life ascended to heaven and sat down. He did all the work to make everything available to us. The only part that he left up to us is to believe. And that believing, that faith, positions me to receive the finished work. Look at it again. Faith is my positive response to what God has made available. Grace has made salvation available to all men, to everyone. But not everyone is saved. Why? Not everyone's believing. It's available for everyone. But your faith believing now positions you to receive salvation. Does that make sense? That's how you gain access to everything that grace has made available. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to most of the people, to all men. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Are all men saved? No. No. Because they have to access the salvation with their faith. Your faith positions you to receive salvation. When I believe on Jesus as my Savior, I'm now receiving that salvation. Does that make sense? Unbelief is the only sin that cannot be forgiven. Why? Because you have to believe in order to be saved. John 3, 16, 17 and 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, what? Believes. Believes in him. Should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whoever believes. All right, verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. This is interesting because a lot of churches condemn people. But Jesus wasn't sent to condemn, but yet I think that's my job as your pastor. Something's not right. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. saved. Verse 18. He who believes. believes, there it is again. Everybody say faith. faith. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. You're condemned already. You're on your way to hell until you believe. Are you getting it? You're condemned already. But the moment that I use my faith, it positions me to receive salvation. Now I'm saved. I'm good. I'm on my way to heaven. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So your faith positions you to receive what grace has provided. Let's break it down. God doesn't send anyone to hell. He's made a way of escape available for everyone. His grace has provided salvation. And when I believe in Jesus as my Savior, my faith, my believing, positions me to receive what he's already provided. I'm not praying so that God will say, oh, look, Joe wants to be saved. I better go pay attention to him. It's already provided, waiting on my faith and my believing to get me into the right position to receive what he's already put in place for me. This works for healing, too. When I understand that by his stripes I'm already healed, my faith moves me into a position to receive 
the finished work. If it works with salvation, it works with healing. Amen. I want everybody to say that. I want everybody to say this. Say, I'm already healed. I'm already healed. Say it again. Say, I'm already healed. I'm already healed. If you don't need healing and you're healthy, then I want you to walk in divine health. Somebody say, amen. amen. Say it again. Say, I'm already healed. I'm already healed. Jesus took care of everything at the cross. So your healing is already there. It's up here. It's grace. That's where I see it. So now I have to use my faith to position me to receive what's already done. I don't use my faith to get God to heal me. Lord, come heal me. He's already done it. So now my faith says, as we read this, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. My faith begins to grow and he's already done it. By his stripes, 1 Peter 2.24, we were healed. It's a done deal. So now my faith begins to grow up on the inside, and as my faith grows, it positions me to receive the finished work, and now healing shows up in my body. Are you getting this? So good. Look, I should never say it's so good. Now watch how this works. If I really do believe that I'm healed, I'll start talking and living like it. I don't go around confessing to everyone that I'm married to Julie. We're just married. I don't say it to be married or to stay married. I say it because I know it's a fact. It's in my heart. We're married. We can't be any more married than we are right now, right? I don't go around saying, I'm trying to be married. I'm confessing that we're married. In the name of Jesus, we're married. Right? You can take my wedding band. You can take the marriage license. You can take her wedding ring. And we're still married because it's in our heart. I believe it in my heart. Are you getting this? And now out of the abundance of the heart, because I know and I believe that we're married, now I speak it. I don't go, I'd like to introduce you to my, are you still my wife? I know in my heart, we're married. I'd like to introduce you to my wife. This is Julie, right? Are you with me? I don't have to think about it. I don't have to go to meet somebody. I hope I get the right word. I hope I say it in the right way. That's the way we approach healing many times. If I say the right words, if I get this formula right, we'll be married. (laughs) No, it's a done deal. Out of the abundance of the heart, I believe it. Therefore, I speak it. You believe. My faith has positioned me to receive the healing. I believe it. I know I'm already healed. It says it right there. I believe this more than I believe my circumstances. Somebody say amen. Amen. So now I speak it from my heart. I'm healed. Say it again. Say I'm healed. healed. Amen. That's awesome. It goes for salvation, healing, anything that grace has provided. You believe it in your heart and you begin to confess it with your mouth. Look at your neighbor. Say that boy's preaching today. Amen. Amen. I know that God has made this available to me. I know it's mine. I know it in my heart. And I believe. And that believing positions you to receive everything that grace has made available. You don't receive your healing because you prayed the proper words. You don't get saved because you cried just enough. I've seen people get saved and never shed a tear. I've seen other people cry for three days after they got saved. It's from their heart. It's not the outward appearance. Are you with me? Both were saved because they believed in their hearts. All right, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. You doing all right? It's a good refresher today. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So check this out. Salvation is a gift. You can't do anything to earn it, and you don't deserve it. You and I don't deserve it. It's a gift from God. The same is true with everything that grace has made available. You can't earn your healing. You can't earn your blessings, restoration, abundance, whatever it is that's been made available for grace and you need it. Grace has made it available and you gain access to it through your faith, it's your believing. You won't walk in blessing if you don't believe that you're supposed to be blessed because it's your faith that positions you to receive it. You won't walk in divine health if you don't believe that it's available. And what two things will start a church fight quicker than anything else? Talking about finances and healing. I'm telling you the truth. There are a lot of Christians who don't want to talk about money, and, they, and there's a lot of Christians who don't believe in divine healing. They don't believe it's for today. So if I were the enemy, I would fight the church and bring division and opposition against anyone who believes in being blessed financially and anyone who believes in healing. Those are the ones I'd go after. Until the pastors are scared to death and they're scared of being attacked and won't talk about it for fear of being labeled a prosperity preacher. It's happening right now. People, I know pastors will not talk about, oh, I'm not talking about, they're scared to death to talk about tithing. Can I be real with you? I'm going to tell on them. <laughs> Years ago, we had a pastor, 
he got up and we were leading worship and he got up and he said, this was years, long, long, long time ago because you're going to try to figure out who it is. <laughs> but he, a long time ago, he said, he got up and he apologized to the church for talking about tithing, didn't he? Remember that? When I first became a worship leader, he said, I am so sorry, I have to talk about this. Uh, basically, just please forgive me, but I got to talk about it. I'm like, whoa, yeah. Pastors are scared to talk about money. All right, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> I can share some more things. Here's, here's my point. If we don't talk about it, you're not going to believe. And if you don't believe, you will never receive it. So I have to talk about it. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I talk about money quite a bit. You know why? I want you blessed. If I never talk about it, you're not going to believe, and then you're not going to receive. Faith positions you, over here, it positions you to receive the financial blessing. But if I don't talk about it, your faith can't grow and it will never position you. Until what happens with many Christians is the moment that I start to talk about money, they shut me off. Oh, no, no, no. They're never going to walk in it. Are you with me? I talk about money a lot, finances, and I talk about healing a lot. You know why? Because I want you healthy. Jesus paid the price for your health. He was whipped on his back so you could see his spine and his bones. His ribs were showing so that you could walk up here. We could lay hands on you and be healed instantly. If he paid the price to get it to you, I want it. Amen. Amen. So that's why I get a little radical. Sometimes it might sound like I'm being mean, but I just want to be real with you. I don't want to waste my entire life preaching and never see it. So I have to preach up here so that you have a place to grow to. I'm not up here giving you information. I'm up here, the Holy Spirit is flowing through me to feed your faith so that you grow and then you come up to this and it now positions you to receive what grace has provided. I'm not preaching to get you through the week. I'm preaching to change your grandkids' lives. Amen? Amen? I want my grandkids to look at us and say, I want to be blessed like grandma and grandpa. Amen? Amen? That's the way it ought to be. Somebody say amen. amen. Maybe I should calm down. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Your faith positions you to receive what grace has made available. But if we don't know because no one will talk about it, we can't receive. It's that simple. It's time for the church to take the limits off of God. Somebody say amen. amen. If you want to serve a God who can't heal, that's okay. But I know he can. I've seen too much. Amen. Right. My God's bigger than that. Throughout scripture, we read where he blesses his people. I want you to see this, Psalm 103, 1 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. benefits. All right, verse 3. So this is like a command. He says, don't forget my benefits. Now here he begins to list them. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed renewed like the eagles. That's walking in divine health. Who said that we have to get sick and end up at the hospital before we die? I know a pastor that was walking in 100% faith, and he says, when I die, I'm just going to sit down and basically blast off. (laughs) <laughs> he sat down for breakfast with his wife and put his head down and he went to be with the Lord. Wow. Wow. Who said we have to suffer? Right. Right. Yeah. Who for, these are just promises. I'm just reading the Bible, all right? Let's allow your faith to grow. Who forgives most of your iniquities? All. How many? All. all means all, right? Who heals all. all your diseases? Either that's true or it's not. What happens is the church looks, we pray for somebody and they didn't get healed, so we base our theology around that rather than this. That will get you in trouble every time. Who forgives all your iniquities. So now my faith is on 10. I'm believing that all of my sins are forgiven. All of them. Past, present, future. Who heals all your diseases. I want you to say this again. Say, I'm healed. Who redeems your life from destruction who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Isn't that awesome? Awesome. I want you to say this. Say, he wants me blessed. blessed. All right, we're going to zero in on verse three. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. Forgiveness of sin and healing for the body go together. 
the blood and the body, who forgives all your iniquities, forgiveness of sin, heals all your diseases, healing for the body. The blood and the body, the juice or the wine and the bread. The blood is for forgiveness of sin. The bread is for healing of, of the body. They go together, but the church has separated them. They're not supposed to be separate. As easy as it is to get saved, we're supposed to receive our healing that easy, easily. Did you know that? They're listed together. Who forgives all our iniquities? Who heals all our diseases? To God, he's like, just saying it. To us, we're like, okay, you can get saved, but now we really got to jump through all these hoops to receive your healing. It's supposed to be just this easy. Somebody say amen. amen. It's important. The church has separated them, but they go together. So how do I receive the forgiveness of sins? I believe. How do I receive my healing? I believe. My faith positions me to receive what grace has made available. Look at your neighbor and say, it's so easy. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I want to show you something. Amen. Are you blessed? Yes. Amen. <laughs> Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't what? Believe. They don't believe. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. Have you ever thought about this verse? I want us to think this morning. Why would Satan have to blind their minds? Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. Why would he have to blind their mind? Because the gospel's glorious. He has to blind their mind. He doesn't want them to see the glorious light of the gospel, so he blinds them, deceives them into believing that living for the Lord's following a bunch of rules. I'm not going up in there. They got this list of rules. So he has to blind their eyes and their minds to it. Are you seeing this? He blinds them and deceives them. He blinds them from all the benefits. He doesn't want, we just read, forget not all my benefits. He doesn't want them to know. He doesn't want the world to know there's benefits to belonging to the family of God. He blinds them from the glory. But it's so easy, it's so glorious. It's attractive. That's why he has to blind their minds. I want to say that again. It's attractive. It attracts them. So he has to blind their minds so they can't see it. I'm going to share it anyway. Guys, have you ever been with your wife and you see a good-looking girl and she'll go like this and cover your eyes? <laughs> if it was a 95-year-old grandma, if she's attractive, she has to blind you, right? Ah, yeah. oh, you got it, didn't you? She doesn't do this. She's like, don't tell them that. That's what the enemy does. The gospel is so attractive, he has to blind the eyes of the world so that they can't see it. Or else the church would be totally full. Every church. They would be breaking the doors down to get in here. Are you getting this? Romans 5.17. We'll keep on moving. Is that all right? <laughs> <I'm just laughs> for, the sin, for the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace. Let's read, I'm going to back up. I'm laughing. I'm going to slow down. I want you to get this. For the, son, for, the son, for the sin of this one man, Adam, so Adam's sin brought this into the world, caused death to rule over many, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness for all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? So we know what grace is, everything that God has made available to us, and righteousness is the ability to stand before God as if I've never sinned. That's justified. The word justified means declared righteous. Justified just as if I'd never sinned. Isn't that cool? Righteousness is the ability to stand before God as if I've never sinned. And it says that righteousness is a gift for all who receive it. How do we receive it? By believing by faith. Are you getting it? And when we receive it by simply believing, we now have the ability to triumph over sin. Romans 6, 14 says, Sin shall not have dominion over you because you're no longer under the law but under grace. It doesn't dominate you anymore. Everybody say, that's grace. That's grace. So how do we triumph over sin and death? Through Jesus. It's so awesome. Here's what I want you to see. It's not your actions. It's not your behavior. It's not your performance. It's not your church attendance. It's not your Bible reading. It's not your giving and tithing. It's not even your prayer life, it's faith in Jesus. Because we list all of those things and we work hard on those things, but it's really my faith. It's my believing, my faith positions me to receive. Does that make sense? It's faith in Jesus. 
knowing that Jesus paid it all, and all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Amen. Amen? And when I truly believe that all my sins are gone once and for all, and I really am saved, safe and secure, now I can live in victory. Let's read this one more time. Go ahead and stand. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. I just want to ask you, is the church in general really living in triumph over sin or are they so sin conscious that that's all they think about? This says, for all who receive it, grace and the gift of righteousness will live in triumph over sin. We shouldn't even be thinking about our sin anymore. We should be forgiveness conscious. The enemy, the accuser of the brethren, throws the fiery darts. You messed up last week. You shouldn't have said that. You're gossiping. You're doing all these things, right? You should, are you with me? But we really should be triumphing over sin and death. Triumphing over death means that death doesn't concern me anymore. Take this life, guess where I'll be? If I go before you, I'll see you soon. All right, I will see you again. If you're in this room and you're born again, I will see you again. What I want to be able to do is when we get to heaven is get freedom people together. Remember when so-and-so got healed? Remember when this happened? Remember when this happened? We're building a history with the Lord. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Everybody just say it's that easy.